Welcome to this week's Money Meadows podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low-cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Meadows Exchange. I'm Mike Leeson, and welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. A few weeks ago, we heard the first half of an interview Money Metals President Stefan Gleason did during a recent 360 Gold Summit. Today, we'll hear part two of that interview. Stefan gives some important warnings to precious metals investors, discusses why he favors one of the precious metals over the others, and also talks about some really important things to consider when selecting a precious metals dealer. Don't miss the eye-opening conclusion of Stefan's interview coming up after this week's market update. Well, the big headline in the markets this week, the S&P 500 pushed to a new all-time high in nominal terms. But is it a new high in real terms? Most in the financial media don't want to ask that question. They would rather join their Wall Street sponsors in celebrating a new official record. President Donald Trump certainly didn't miss the opportunity to boast about the stock market's strength under his watch. The stock market... And our country, from an economic standpoint, is doing the best probably it's ever done. We're hitting new highs again. We've hit new highs, I guess, close to or over 100 times since I'm president from the time of the election. You heard the president starting off there with the stock market. Obviously, he sees that as a piece of good news and an overall barometer for the economy under his leadership. Uh, I asked the president how high he thinks the stock market can go. He didn't respond to that one. The Trump tax cuts for corporations and his administration's relative business-friendly approach to regulation have certainly given equity markets a boost. But stocks have also benefited from a general rising sea of liquidity thanks to the Federal Reserve. Investors shouldn't be fooled by records that get set because of artificial stimulus from central bankers. There has never been a clearer case of the Federal Reserve goosing the stock market than the current rally that began off last year's pre-Christmas lows. Under pressure from Wall Street and the White House plunge protection team to back off on rate hikes, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell announced a pause. Earlier this spring, he confirmed the pause would continue for the remainder of the year. For Wall Street, it has been perhaps the greatest pause of all time, judging by the nominal gains registered over the past four months. Despite the celebratory mood surrounding stocks, there is a striking number of what market technicians call non-confirmations. The transportation index hasn't hit a new high. The small cap Russell 2000 index is nowhere near a new high. And the S&P 500 itself is far short of a new high when measured against raw materials, including crude oil and gold. Yes, despite the gold market's frustratingly sluggish performance over the past few years, the monetary metal has still outperformed the stock market over a longer term frame. It may be hard to believe given all the current hoopla around stocks, but since 2000, gold bullion has still doubled the gains of the S&P 500. Stocks are up big in terms of dollars. In terms of hard money, though, it's been a lost generation for equities. Investors won't necessarily hear that inconvenient truth told to them by the talking heads on CNBC. Turning to this week's market action in precious metals, gold is managing a 0.9% gain to trade at $1,289 an ounce, with most of that gain coming here thanks to a bit of a Friday rally. Silver, which dropped below $15 in trading earlier this week, is now a tick above it and is essentially unchanged on the week now to bring spot prices to $15.10. The platinum market shows a weekly decline of 0.8% to trade at an even $900. And finally, palladium looks higher by 1.4% this week as prices check in at $1,462 per ounce and like gold with all of that gain coming here on Friday. Metals markets faced headwinds this week from both a rising stock market and rising U.S. dollar index. The dollar rose toward a two-year high against its major foreign currency counterparts. Even as the Federal Reserve has turned dovish, Central banks around the developed world, from Japan to Sweden to Canada, have turned even more dovish. They are aggressively committing to ultra-low interest rates, in some cases even negative interest rates, in the face of weak economies. If this dynamic continues to push the dollar higher against foreign currencies, the Fed will come under increasing pressure to cut rates. Futures markets are currently pricing in a quarter-point rate cut by the end of the year. Fed policymakers haven't yet signaled they will make such a move. 
but there are signs the economy is slowing significantly enough to give them justification. Despite the record high stock market and historically low official unemployment rate, GDP is slumping and housing is hitting the skids. Perhaps investor optimism towards stocks will finally begin to wane. The big question is whether the next round of Fed stimulus benefits primarily the stock market again or whether monetary inflation gets reflected more in other asset classes such as commodities and precious metals. That question could start getting answered later this year. Well, now, without further delay, let's get to this week's featured interview of Money Metals President Stefan Gleason as we listen to the conclusion of his remarks during the 360 Gold Summit, a discussion about all things precious metals. And we start off where Stefan answers the important question about how to select a precious metals dealer. You want to be careful about who you're doing business with. You want to do a little research. Probably start small with that dealer and see how it goes, Mm -hmm. see how the service is, see how the delivery is. Now, another place to acquire precious metals would be from a local dealer. You know, Money Metals Exchange is a national dealer, and there's other, several other good national dealers. Local dealers are a little bit more sort of unknown. Some are very good, some are not. One of the problems, though, buying locally is that you are often faced with sales taxes. Many states, I think it's about 20 states, actually force dealers who sell inside of their states to collect sales taxes, which are significant, especially when you consider that an ounce of gold might cost 5 6 7% over spot. Well, if you add a 7% sales tax to that, that's a huge, huge markup in the context of the numbers you normally see in precious metals. So that is a disadvantage that many local dealers have when compared to a national dealer. But the advantage, perhaps, especially if you're very nervous about dealing with somebody from a long distance, is that presumably you can walk out that day with your metals after having paid and instead of having to wait a couple days in the mail for it to arrive. Uh, On the other hand, you know, they may not be as well equipped locally to detect fakes, which are not a big problem, but they they are out there. And there, there may be less education component involved, but look at your options. Obviously, our customers are buying from us. Uh, Many of them bought locally and then changed to us. Hmm. That's a really interesting observation you know, with the sales tax. When you think about it, you're actually exchanging one form of currency for real money, and you're not buying any, you're not selling anything, you're, you're right. exchanging. Right. That's, that ahead. is an extremely concerning subject that, okay, as you pointed out, you're changing one form of money, paper, you know, U.S. dollars or coins, for another form of money that's recognized by our Constitution as money. You know, Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution sets up gold and silver as the only money uh, that's supposed to be accepted in the states. And we've obviously got away from that. So the idea that you would have to pay sales taxes as though it's some sort of good as opposed to money. Could you imagine, you know, if you went to the bank and had to pay sales tax to break a $10 bill into into a roll of quarters? I mean, that that's basically the equivalent. So gold and silver mm-hmm. is disfavored by the sales tax laws in many states. And then at the federal level, you have to pay capital gains taxes when your gold and silver goes up in dollar terms, but it may not have really gone up in the context of purchasing power. What happened was the dollar went down. So it's kind Mm -hmm. of an example of the inflation tax. You're being taxed essentially through the capital gains tax on the inflation that the government is creating. And so these are the kinds of public policies that we're working to spotlight and hopefully change over time, and that is to repeal these sales tax laws that are discriminatory against people exchanging one form of money for a better, more trusted form of money. And then, of course, the capital, the discriminatory capital gains tax. And unfortunately, it's even at a higher rate than, say, a stock. You know, a long-term capital gain on gold bullion is taxed at 28%, not 15% like you would with a gain in a stock. So there's definitely some problems. We can get into this in a minute, but that's one of the advantages of holding precious metals in your IRA is that you can buy and sell without having to to pay those gains every time. Is there anything more important than choosing the right product and getting it for a low price? The most important thing is getting delivery, and that means getting your metal. And I would say that in some cases, the lowest price can be a red flag. If somebody's selling gold and silver for below its actual value, there's probably something wrong. I mean, we we recently 
ran across somebody who had bought some uh, gold from a Bitcoin exchange, and he bought it at a discount, discount to its market price. Well, that's kind of a red flag. Gold and silver is not at a discount to the spot price, particularly on the buy side. So the lowest price is not necessarily the best, safest place to go. Obviously, there's some very good low-cost dealers, including Money Metals Exchange. But there's also been horror stories of you know low-cost dealers. And I'll mention one that went out of business, Tolving Company, and they were super low, no service, almost kind of mean to their customers if you dealt with them. But eventually, at, some, at one point, about two years ago, hundreds of people stopped getting delivery. And something like $20 million worth of gold and silver was never delivered. So getting a low price is no good at all if you're not actually getting your metal. So the most important thing is working with somebody and getting what you paid for. Very true. How does the average person trust the dealer or organization that supplied the coin or bullion? Well, I mean, the first thing is doing a little research. You should always do that with any kind of purchase. You should know who you're dealing with. You know, when it comes to precious metals dealers, the first thing I think, you know, look them up on the BBB. See if there are complaints. See what, how they've handled those complaints. Everybody probably can have a complaint, but how they've dealt with those, how many they have, what kind of rating they have, that's one way of, of doing the research. There's another site called bullion.directory, which has reviewed hundreds of companies across the globe. And we were honored to have been named Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the United States last year by that ratings group, uh, international ratings group. So those are two things you can do to research the BBB and bullion.directory. And that's literally the web address, bullion.directory. The other thing is size them up. Look at their website. Look at the content that they have. If they have an email list, get on their email list and start small. If you're worried about you're not 100% sure, well, you know, buy a small amount and just see how it goes. See how good the communication is. See if they provide you with transparent pricing and fast delivery. Do they confirm that they got your payment? Was their invoice exactly what you expected? Was it packaged well? Was there pride put into the way they handled everything with their customer? And if you have a good experience, that's a really good sign. Obviously, it's not a guarantee, but you really need to pay attention to the people you're doing business with. And that's just as much, if not more, the case when it comes to precious metals. What sort of considerations are important to make before and after acquiring? Well, I would say that there's a couple things that I would emphasize. One is, what are you going to do with it when you get it? Where are you going to put it? How are you going to store it? And most of our customers probably keep it somewhere in their house. A few will put it in their bank safe deposit box. Some will store it in a depository or at a Brinks facility. Some will put it in their home safe, but some will hide it, you know, in other sort of unpredictable places. So if you have a lot of precious metals, and you probably want to have some of it stored remotely, just because that's a lot to have in your house. I do think that everybody should have the ability to get their hands on their gold and silver, at least some of it, very quickly if they need to. So storage is one consideration. Some people are reluctant, and I can understand why, to to store it in their bank safe deposit box. In fact, the banks are part of this war on cash and and even war on precious metals. Some banks are, are saying you can't hold gold and silver or cash in your bank safe deposit box, so you may be banking with one of those banks. But there's also concerns from back in the 1930s, FDR issued an executive order banning private gold ownership in America that you know some people uh, felt like the gold that they had in their safe deposit box was being disclosed and potentially seized. That never actually happened, but most people turned it in voluntarily, or many people did. But there's less privacy, perhaps, if you hold it in the bank. And so I think you know people rightly are a little reluctant to do that. The other thing is, uh, in addition to figuring out how you're going to store it and where you're going to put it, is really to to think about the responsibility that you have as a precious metals owner or just as a person to keep your financial business to yourself. A trusted person or a spouse certainly should be aware of what to happen if something happens to you, but you shouldn't be talking about how you bought all this gold and silver, bringing out your collection and showing it to everybody that comes and visits. There's been, unfortunately, some really horrific situations where people have not kept their mouth shut have been you know, talking way too much about what they owned and found themselves with a home invasion or a robbery. And so you know, that's the other thing. So figure out how you're going to store it and also discipline yourself to keep your financial business as private as possible. 
Very good points. Uh, how can the average person best understand appreciation of his holdings or the upside value? Well, the first reason to own gold and silver isn't necessarily for these spectacular gains, although I think you're going to see those, at least in dollar terms. The first reason is to own it as insurance and as a hedge. But particularly with silver, probably also with gold, there's a, a huge potential upside, even in real terms. And right now we're seeing negative interest rates emerge in Europe. We're seeing zero interest rates here in the U.S., so one of the big knocks on gold and silver is, well, it doesn't pay any interest. Well, neither does the dollar now. And then on top of that, you actually have the devaluation of the principal when you own dollars. So gold and silver is becoming a very attractive asset. And that's particularly been evidenced in the last few months. And gold and silver have done extremely well. So there's definitely some real potential upside to gold and silver. In terms of when to get out, I mean, I think that you probably want to be owning gold and silver forever, a certain amount. But if you're more of a speculator and you have larger amounts, then you, you probably do want to be looking for opportunities to sell over time. But I would say right now as a buying opportunity down the road, you could see silver at 100 bucks an ounce or even higher. Gold could be several thousand dollars an ounce before this is all over, particularly if the devaluation continues and maybe you'll want to lighten your holdings. But right now, I think you're wise to be in the accumulation mode unless you need the money, just you need to liquidate for other reasons. That makes sense. I guess related would be when might an average person consider liquidating his holdings? Are there any solid event types that might precipitate liquidating all of what you have versus only some of what you have? If you see the U.S. government live within its means and the debt goes from $18 trillion down to zero, that might be a good time to seriously lighten up on precious metals. I personally don't see that happening. I don't think most people do. I think we're going to be, we're kind of locked on a path here. So I think mm -hmm. there's always going to be a significant role for precious metals in your portfolio regardless. But perhaps if you saw an outbreak of sanity in Washington, D.C. and around the world and peace emerging and all these geopolitical things simmering down and terrorism going away, and I think that it might be time to, to seriously consider selling a, a fair amount of your gold and silver. But we're not in that situation. The way to, to approach this is to not try to pick a bottom or a top. It would be accumulate over time in smaller amounts. Don't go all in and don't sell all at once. So I'd look at this as a way of just you know, getting on a plan and slowly and steadily increasing the number of ounces that you own. And then if we get down the road and you do see things changing and 40% of the American people are talking about, you know, you're going to the, you know, you're getting your shoes shine and the guy's talking about owning gold and silver. Well, maybe that's the time to, to start selling. But we're nowhere near that kind of situation. And most people are dangerously exposed and not owning any. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would get on a monthly plan and just accumulate. Now's the time to accumulate. Down the road would be a time to potentially disgorge some of your holdings or, or if you have a need for it. You're in retirement or you have some big expenses. Obviously, you don't want to lock up all of your available cash and precious metals. Just do what you can over time to accumulate, and I think you'll be rewarded for it. And somewhat related in terms of best places to get it, what about best places to liquidate it? Are there, is there a type of list of would-be investor might consider comparing against or going to? Well, usually, uh, and certainly the case with Money Metals Exchange, usually you can sell to the same people that you buy from. We'll buy anybody's gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. We obviously check it and ensure that it is what it is. We make sure we have it in our facility before we pay the customer once we verify it. But we buy back, and we love to buy back. And unfortunately for us, uh, most of our customers are just buying from us, and very few are selling to us. So we actually have to buy from mints and wholesalers and the U.S. Mint and so forth. We'd love to buy more of our inventory from our customers because obviously we're, we're buying from a middleman. We do make a market. Probably only about 5 to 10% of our inventory is sourced from our customers. We're eager to buy and we offer probably the highest or among the highest buyback prices of any of our competitors. So we're as eager to buy from our customers as we are to sell to our customers. And that's probably the case with most dealers. And we're not retailers, we're dealers. And that means that we both buy and sell. So you probably would go back to where you bought it, but you don't have to. I mean, we buy 
stuff from people that they bought elsewhere all the time and are happy to do so. The items that we deal in are very standard, recognizable, liquid. And some people may want to sell to their local dealer, and that's fine too. They want to walk out with the cash that they may not get as good a price, uh, but it depends on what your priorities are. So there's no problem selling your precious metals. And that's and a very good question because a lot of times people say, well, how do I sell it? What do I do with it? It's really just about as easy to sell it as it is to buy it. You contact a dealer or walk into a dealer uh, shop and they offer you a price and you give them the metal and they pay you. It's that simple. So it's just about a, it's about the same process in reverse as when you buy from us. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here. How about other precious metals like platinum, palladium, and et cetera? Are there times when an investor should be considering acquiring those precious metals or vice versa, liquidating the same if they're already held? Well, platinum and palladium are the other two major precious metals. There's rhodium, for example, which is uh, even less sort of considered an uh, investment asset. Platinum and palladium are still very small part of the precious metals market. There's less of it. I should mention, but it's not as big of an investment asset. It's more of an industrial asset. So platinum and palladium are used for catalytic converters, diesel and gasoline catalytic converters. And so with automotive demand, for example, platinum and palladium can go up and down based on what's happening in the automotive market. But it is also a financial asset. And there's ETFs now, and there's, of course, there's physical bars and and rounds and, and coins of all of these, including platinum and palladium. But I would Definitely not get into those until you've already got a significant or at least a reasonable holding of gold and silver. Those are the two that you want to start with. Platinum and palladium is is a little bit sort of down the road. But in terms of the upside, again, a lot of it's driven by industrial demand, but they are also undervalued versus gold. As I discussed earlier, silver is way undervalued versus gold historically, both in recent history as well as in the longer term history. But platinum and palladium are undervalued. Platinum is way below the price of one ounce of gold, and it's typically one and a half to two times the price of gold over time. So platinum is way undervalued versus gold. But again, that's really not something to jump into until after you already have a a meaningful holding of, of gold and silver. It also sounds like something that you probably wouldn't do until you better understood the market and price swings and so forth of the precious metals in general. What about owning precious metals in your IRA? How does that work? Should you own the physical metal <laughs> shares of metals backed by ETFs? Yeah. Well, you know, ETFs, again, if you want to trade and you want to do it in your stock account, it's convenient. But there are these precious metals backed ETFs. They're really a, a proxy you don't own direct title to the metal. You own shares of a trust that supposedly owns the metal. And then there's a whole series of custodians and sub-custodians and sub-sub-custodians involved in that kind of instrument. So if you're buying gold and silver as insurance, then why introduce counterparty risk into something that's supposed to be your safe asset? And there are reasons people want to buy that. Certainly it's convenient, but it's not necessarily cheaper than owning it and storing it and paying the storage fees yourself. There's still fees involved in the ETFs. I don't think that that's really something people should be doing. They should be buying physical gold and silver that they have direct title to. What sort of things or education can the average person do for themselves to be better prepared to consider precious metals investing? Well, absolutely. And this is something our our company, Money Metals Exchange, is really big on, and that's education and content. We want our customers to be well-informed. We want to keep them updated. So there's lots of websites out there, but a great place is to you know go to moneymetals.com and get on our email list, and we send out two or three informative articles about the markets each week. Pay attention. Get a little gold and silver in your hand. Start thinking about it. Start thinking about what it means. Compare it to paper money. And it's interesting. The first time I had gold and silver in my hand 20 years ago, it really got the wheels turning. Like, what is this fiat money? What is this Federal Reserve note? Why does it have value? Why do people accept it? And compared that to this beautiful, timeless metal of gold and silver, and it really gets the wheels turning. And that opened up an education process for me. And I think it does for a lot of people. And we think the best customers are the best informed, and, that, and that's certainly what we strive for. I want to mention precious metals IRAs. That's one thing that is an area where people might be best able to put money into precious metals because they have IRA accounts. 
there's something called a self-directed IRA, and you can set up an account uh, with a self-directed IRA company and then work with a dealer like us and with a depository. You can directly hold title. Your IRA can directly hold title to physical metal inside of your IRAs. That's another way of getting into this market that we definitely encourage people to look at. A lot safer these speculating in the stock market, that's for sure. Is there any method of the madness in, in how the average person might approach what he considers owning or holding? When I say that, for example, is there any sort of 80-20 type of rule or rules of ratio for gold to silver holdings? I would say that the more likely you are to need to access the gold and silver and turn it into cash or liquidate out of it, the more likely that's the case, probably the higher percentage that you're going to want to have in gold. Gold tends to be a little more consistent. It's rising, but it's less of a roller coaster. Silver can be quite volatile when priced in dollars. And of course, some of that's just the volatility of the dollar itself. But I would say if you're looking at a three to five year horizon, then definitely favor silver. You're going to own gold and silver for a year or two and think you might need to liquidate out of it. And then perhaps you should favor gold and have a majority of, of your funds in gold. But this isn't something that you should be buying and selling like a stock. This is something you should be accumulating and not necessarily looking to liquidate it anytime soon. I mean, it's there if you need it. Don't necessarily plan on buying gold and silver if you think you're going to need the money in six months. There are some transaction costs involved, um, not significant if you go to the right places, but that's just something to keep in mind. But going back to you know what I said earlier, silver is definitely the more uh, potentially explosive upside metal. So if as long as you're not looking very short term, uh, I would definitely have a majority of your funds in silver. And uh, but make sure you get some gold. Very good. Well, we're running up against kind of a time constraint here and. I wanted to thank you for joining us today and offering all of your just excellent uh, insight and, and observations and answers to all the questions that we've thrown at you today. Before we leave, though, I'd, I'd like to offer you and uh, let people know how to reach you and, and contact you on Money Metals Exchange. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And hopefully I've shown education is a big part of what we do at Money Metals. Uh, I think compared to other dealers, that's one of our very strongest differentiating factors. Go to moneymetals.com, look at the products. Most importantly, get on our email list and let us continue to, to educate you about the market. And we also have a monthly savings plan, which you can get into, uh, where you set up a certain amount each month where we debit your bank account or whatever your instructions are and send you on a steady schedule, gold and silver. And that's a great way to accumulate, kind of put it on autopilot. So that's available at moneymetals.com as well. But I'd certainly really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this you know, important subject and, and also about our company. Well, thank you for joining us today. And folks, thanks for listening in. And we hope you guys have a great day. You've just heard the conclusion of Stefan's interview with Pete Fedig during the recent 360 Gold Summit. We hope you enjoyed it. If you happen to miss the first half of the interview, be sure to check it out either on the MoneyMetals.com website or by downloading it on iTunes. Well, that will do it for this week. Please check back next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Gleason with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions, or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.